Last week, we discussed Nancy Pelosi's flip from taking responsibility for January 6th Capitol riots to blaming former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund. And Sund recently spoke out denouncing Pelosi's claim about the National Guard. Matthew Peterson is the editor-in-chief of Blaze News, and Stephen Sund is also here. He joins us now. So, Stephen, what really happened with Nancy Pelosi and the National Guard on January 6th? Well, thank you very much, both uh, Jill and Matthew, for having me on today. Uh, it's interesting when you look back at it and I see the video coming out, I've been waiting, you know, with all the news that Alexandra Pelosi was filming on that day, the report of it, I was waiting for some of that to get released. And now that's getting released, I think uh, it's going to be interesting. So the fact that she's coming out and she's saying she takes responsibility, she is, you know, the Speaker of the House, she has a lot of responsibility over the Capitol. But when you look at it and you look at the requirements they had in place for me to request assistance in advance and on January 6th, um, they play a significant role. And let me get into that. Um, there's a law, it's called 2 U.S. 1970. It requires me as the chief of police to get approval of the uh, Capitol Police Board, which is the House and Senate Sergeant Arm and the architect of the Capitol, and congressional leadership to bring in any assistance for my men and women uh, in advance of an event. On January 3rd, in the morning of January 3rd, I went and specifically asked the House Sergeant Arms for the request of the National Guard and was denied. Denied specifically, one, he didn't like, like the optics of it, and he didn't think that intelligence uh, supported it. He referred me over to the Senate Sergeant Arms. When I went over to talk to him, they had already come up with an idea that they weren't going to approve it. They wanted me to just reach out to the National Guard and see if we needed them, how long it might take for them to get there, but they wouldn't approve it. So by law, I'm required to go to them. So that's a law that passed by Congress. So they denied me on January 3rd, even on January 6th, while we're under attack. We become under attack at 1253 on the West Front. 1255, I called D.C. police, ask for assistance there. That's my old agency. I was with them for 25 and a half years. And then I call uh, Paul Irving at 1258 p.m. and ask for assistance of the National Guard to bring in federal resources, which I'm required by law to do. It took 71 minutes, 11 repeat calls uh, back to find out from the two Sarge arms where we are on my request before they finally approved that request at 2.09 p.m. So now to hear her say that she bears some responsibilities, yeah, I think it's about time. I mean, this is just remarkable. Every time we hear about this, I get more interested, not less, and more upset, not less. Um, how would you describe the trajectory, though, the last three years? I mean, why is this winding, weaving path being taken and why has Pelosi, uh, you know, how has she changed over time? What do you think is going on? Um, again, I think their their main focus, and you see it in the video that's being released, is mainly the executive branch. Their focus is, uh, you know, blame on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My focus as the former police chief of police, and when I started sitting down and, and just taking notes, I wasn't even planning on putting it together a book was to develop an after action or a critical incident review. So I'm looking at it from what's the nuts and bolts of what went wrong. I think they're looking at it from the political aspect. And it's the political aspect that ruining that ruins the policing of on Capitol Hill. If they if they left the politics out of it and let me do my job, we wouldn't be here talking right now. Can you explain how you were hamstrung on January 6th with all of the bureaucratic puzzle, the, the structure that you were required to go through and, and get that permission to make sure that you knew what was happening on that day? Yeah, I mean, and just for your viewers to, to realize, I'm in the command center. I'm sitting in a command center. It's a large uh, blackened out room, video cameras all over and video screens watching the fighting taking place. And repeatedly, I'm picking up the phone because I'm required to get approval from the Capitol Police Board to bring in any resources. And, you know, when I couldn't get that approval after second, third, fourth call, I started calling every chief of police I could. So I started calling in police, even though I hadn't gotten authorization yet. I started calling in federal resources, started calling in Secret Service, even though they wouldn't give me any, uh, any assistance. And what the, the bad thing is, is Besides the D.C. police, which is the largest 3,800 people, uh, 3,800 member police department in the city, the next largest cadre of assistance I could get my officers was 190, uh, I'm sorry, 180 National Guard troops that were within eyesight of the Capitol. And for hours, I repeatedly called trying to get approval for them. Once I got approval at uh, 2.09 p.m., I thought I called William Walker. I called William Walker, the general, the, the commanding general of the D.C. National Guard, even before I got approval, saying, please send me whatever you can. I called him at 149 before I got approval. I called him again at 209. 234, I'm on a call with the Pentagon. Pentagon wants to know why I need assistance. They're watching exactly what we're seeing on your screen, on their big screen TVs, and they're asking why I need more assistance. It's, it's crazy. They didn't send any help. I was on the call with them when we had the shooting of Ashley Babbitt. 
They didn't send any help for three hours and 19 minutes after that call. Why, why do you think this happened this way this day? I mean, what's your, your best uh, account for how this played out? Um, I think, you know, when you, when you look at it, there's a lot of different ways of uh, slicing this one. But I think politics um, got too much into, into security, even during the 2020 protests. And you look at it, the 2020 protests, you had a really bad protests over at the White House. Um, there's a lot of times that my security posture up on Capitol Hill was influenced and they tried to put pressure on me about having my troops in hard gear, uh, having metal barriers out uh, from my oversight uh, staffers, my oversight members of Congress. Uh, and I think they just allow the security apparatus on the Hill to be t- become too politicized. When you have a law that affects uh, when a chief of police can call in resources, that's getting a little too crazy. I'm the only chief of police that I'm aware of in the United States of America that has a federal law that re- requires me to get permission from Capitol Police Board and members of Congress to bring in any resources for my men and women. That's crazy. Who knows security best? A 25, 26-year veteran or staffers for a member of Congress? Can, can you describe what it's been like these last couple of years um, to, to go through this, you know, kind of post-looking-back assessment and then have to deal with what seems like being unfairly blamed often uh, by people in power. What's that, what has that been like personally? And, and what, what has happened there? Explain to people who have never heard this before uh, what, what's, what it's been like. Um, it, is, it has been personally, uh, it's, it's been pretty rough. But the blame game started immediately. It's not like it's just coming out with the HBO video. You know, at 11 o'clock at night on the night of the 6th, I had a call with members of Congress. And one of the members of Congress, Tim Ryan from um, uh, Ohio, was screaming at me um, about how come I didn't order my troops, my officers to open fire on the crowd. Think about that. Um, so he, he's screaming at me. Pelosi goes on national TV on the 7th, calls for my resignation, says it's a failure of leadership at the top, and says I never even spoke to her since the attack occurred. I called her three times. And spoke to her three times. So the blame game started from that point on. The thing I regret most is I wish I had fought more and didn't submit my resignation. Um, based if I knew now, would I? If I knew then what I know now, I would have absolutely fought this all the way. Um, but it's been it's been physically, emotionally, mentally tough. But you know, I talked to the, I, I talked to Capitol Police, DC Police. I talked to police across the country almost every day. Um, the relationship I have with them and the mentoring back and forth has been extremely helpful. Uh, but it's, it's sad to just see, you know, the, um, uh, demeanor, uh, it's just, you know, the outlook of the officers right now is still, still kind of low up on the Hill. Um, and you know, I I really, I still too, truly do care about the men and women of that department a lot. I do miss them a lot. Stephen, our last question for you is what do you think that average people should know about January 6th and what happened that day? it could have absolutely been prevented. You know, when you look at the five uh, uh, committee reports and even the uh, the first report from the uh, Senate combined rules and, and Homeland Security um, hearing that it had in February of 2021 to the Senate, the select report, a uh, select committee, I'm sorry, to the uh, January 6th, uh, the current committee with uh, Barry Loudermilk, report after report after report says this was an intelligence failure, whether it's from how the FBI, the DHS, or my own intelligence unit handled intelligence, if they had handled it correctly, this wouldn't have happened. There would have been fencing up, there would have been mutual aid, I would have gotten more support from the Capitol Police Board and members of Congress, and we wouldn't be here. So it absolutely was preventable. If people want more information about this, I mean, uh, uh, have you written, are you writing on this? Is there a place they can go to know more about your story? Yeah, I've, I, I've actually, I actually wrote a book. And again, I, you yeah. know, I've done so many after action reports and so many critical incident reviews. Um, I started writing, and I wrote probably seven, eight hundred pages. But I have a three hundred ninety-four page book out. It's uh, Courage Under Fire. It's on um, Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. It's through Blackstone Publishing. You can get it through there too. Uh, and it's again, it's about the ridicule myself and my officers got following January six. But it it puts everything together. It's been called the definitive after action on the Hill. It's been referenced in congressional reports. I can't believe I'm talking to you guys forty four, almost forty five months later, and we don't have a more definitive after action report. And this is, I, my book's actually going down in history right now is, is probably the most accurate uh, accounting of what actually occurred on Capitol Hill on January 6th. Well, I'll, I would say look for Courage Under Fire, Under Siege, Outnumbered 50, 58 to 1. Yeah. 
We'll see you. I'll definitely be picking that up. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you very much, Matthew. And Matt, when you look at this, this is such an important topic. And th the fact that we just got all the information that we did is astounding. Again, he said 45 months later. Yeah, look, I mean, like he said, people have been playing politics with this from the beginning, and it's shameful. I mean, he's not playing politics. He's just trying to tell the truth about what happened that day. And I don't think this issue goes away as long as people continue to use it as a political ramrod, which they are. So uh, we need to uh, continue to talk about this, to investigate it, and to get to the bottom of it. And I know our audience is still interested because it's still being used as a political weapon, very sadly, by irresponsible people uh, who unfortunately run this country. Music